Today we have Beth with us. Um, Beth and I, um, we met when in 2015 uh, after the Adventure Therapy Conference, uh, I went over to Columbus in Ohio and she very graciously, her and her partner um, hosted me for a while while I was um, just, you know, interning, like slash volunteering at um, their center and uh, just got to learn so much. I got to just observe their programs and just sort of be a fly on the wall, um, you know, and that was really, I think for me at that point, the question was just like, what does this look like? Like, how does this work look? Because it was just an idea in my head. And so, um, you know, it's been really like such a, such a joy to really witness it and have that opportunity and I have very fond memories of uh, Beth's pets and time <laughs> at her home. Um, and so, yeah, so lovely that we can connect again and then have you here with us. Thank you so much, Beth. Yeah, thanks for inviting me today. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, and I thought that, um, you know, maybe what we're going to do is just, just have an informal chat. Um, and I would love for all of you the, to ask questions as well. So please just put them in the chat and then maybe we can get to them but just put them in and or you could also just unmute and ask in the middle like don't don't worry about waiting till the end like just jump in and interrupt that's completely okay um and yeah so maybe you can get going i think we'll be here for the next 40 minutes or so um and yeah so bet um i'd love to love to know about like how did you even get you know just what brought you to adventure therapy? Like what's, what's your story? Sure. Um, for me, that was, um, an accident, a very happy accident. Um, uh, I think it goes back to when I was working on my social work degree, um, we're required in the United States to do, um, field placements or internships, uh, for a certain number of hours every year. Um, in order to shadow and observe and then start to do social work before we are um, graduated and licensed and able to go out into the field ourselves. And the um, field placement that I ended up in, I was in a hospital, which is where I thought I wanted to be. Um, and I still remember um, doing things like skipping down the hallways and whistling and having people look at me sideways like what are you doing that's not appropriate um so just over time realizing that um, hospital social work was very much about trying to help people get back home so making sure they had a ride making sure if they needed crutches that they had crutches um that they had someone at home to help care for them while they were recovering from a surgery or from an injury or from an illness and and then I sent them home and that was kind of the end of it. I would never have that opportunity to connect back and say, how are you doing? Um, if there were any mental health concerns at that time, it was more referring them out to other services that were available in the community, not necessarily providing, um, providing the mental health service. So um, while the job was interesting um, and the people that I worked with were very passionate about helping and caring for people who were in the hospital and making sure that they got home safely, I just realized that I was miserable. And that was not that me skipping and whistling down the hallways was kind of the universe telling me like, this is not, you shouldn't be in an institution. This is not where you belong. Um, so I went back to my university and, and asked the person who helped assign students to their field placements, told her my story. And she and I had had an opportunity to connect on a more personal level. Um, so she knew that I loved being outside. She knew that I, um, at the time she was a swimmer uh, and I was training for a triathlon. So we connected on that level too. So she knew I was an active person. And um, simply from those conversations, she helped me realize like, maybe this isn't the career path that you want to be on. And we can shift that now while you're still a student um, and give you another opportunity to, to get a look at something else. And she ended up encouraging me and helping me um, connect with um, an agency called Camp Mary Orton. Um, it's a large patch of green space and they have a high ropes course and a low ropes course. 
um, and lots of hiking trails, lots of nature, a creek and a river. Um, and uh, she connected me with the person who managed a very small therapy program that they ran out at Camp Mary Orton. And they, so I, I got to learn about adventure therapy. And I remember showing up for the tour and an interview because she had the right of refusal. She could have said like, nope, I don't have room for another intern. I'm sorry, you're going to have to go back to the hospital. So I remember touring around the property as she was telling me about, about the internship opportunity and and like bells were going off in my head. Like, this is amazing. I get to play with kids. I get to make food with them over a campfire. You're kidding. Like people get paid to do this and we can do therapy and do these things. That sounds incredible. So um, I was only there for the last part of my internship. So it was kind of a three month crash course in adventure therapy um, and going from a hospital setting to nature was a complete shift for me. Um, and working from people who were experiencing physical illness with children who were experiencing mental health issues was also a very big shift, but that was where I really felt a connection. And I felt like, oh my gosh, this is where I can whistle and this is where I can skip. <laughs> and this is where I can run and play um, and get dirty and come home smelling like campfire. Like this is, this is where I should be. So that was how I, I ended up staying in this field of experiential education and using experiential methods to help kids. That was where I really connected. So that's where I've been ever since. <laughs> yeah. And were you working with like mostly teenagers at uh, Camp Mary Orton? Yeah. Um, we worked with a really diverse group of, of individuals at Camp Mary Orton. So most of what camp did at the time was provide a space for children in the community to have a summer camp experience. So to get out of the city and come experience nature, but not necessarily therapy. So the therapy program was very small and that was separate. And we worked with a variety of mental health agencies in central Ohio who were interested in the adventure therapy piece. So we were providing this very specialized group therapy service and in, people would contract with us to provide a group therapy service on top of services that they're their patients or their clients were already receiving. So I worked with adults who were dealing with drug and alcohol issues. I worked with um, uh, women who had um, been arrested and charged on uh, for prostitution um, and ended up in treatment instead, uh, fortunately. Uh, and I worked with lots of kids, lots of ages. So school-based programs, as well as um, residential facilities, so places where kids would go to live because their home situation was so unstable, um, as well as kids who were still able to function pretty well out in the community, but needed that extra boost. Um, so, uh, so yeah, kids of all ages, probably the youngest I've ever worked with has been six. Um, and the oldest kid I've worked with is, is 18, but definitely some adults in there as well. Now I exclusively work with children um, and I work at a, at a community-based mental health agency um, that specifically serves children and families. And right now I'm in a school, but fortunately I'm in a school where they're okay with me skipping and whistling in the hallway. So it works out okay. Okay. And, and right now you're working at the Buckeye Ranch? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more uh, about the place you're currently working at and also sure. like what a typical day at work looks like, if there's anything like that for you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so the Buckeye Ranch is, um, is the second largest community-based mental health agency in central Ohio. Um, so we serve anybody that's on um, government funded um, health insurance. So um, folks who typically don't have a lot of access to services and don't have the money to pay for specialty services can come to us and we will provide whatever service they need. So we work with um, kiddos that are in foster care. Um, so who don't have any family connections and need a place to live that's safe and that's stable. Um, we work with kids who are out in the community, maybe they're struggling at school. So again, we give them that extra boost. Usually there's some things that are related to mental health that are happening for them, some anxiety, some depression. Um, um, social stressors, environmental stressors, we can help with those things. And the Buckeye Ranch does everything in between. So we also have a residential treatment facility where the children live. 
um, and go through treatment for drug and alcohol related issues as well as mental health issues. Where I work is a school based setting. Um, it's uh, the level of care is called day treatment. I don't know if there's there's um, similar levels of care um, in other countries as well. So I'll explain that a little bit. And you might be nodding your head like, yes, I know what you're talking about, but just in case. Um, so these are kids who have really struggled at their school as well as at home. For many of them, they're right on the cusp of ending up in residential treatment. So they're about to, their parents are about to lose it. So um, we're kind of their last chance um, before they might end up in prison or they might end up in, in residential treatment. Um, so we work with kids who really struggle, who have been aggressive with staff at their school, who've been aggressive with other children, um, who have you know, damaged property, done some property destruction, who've experimented with drugs and alcohol at a very young age, or who are dealing with maybe depressive symptoms that are so extreme that they um, walk into their classroom and immediately curl up in a ball and lay under their desk and then refuse to move for the rest of the day. Um, so those are the level of care of kids that I currently work with and provide adventure therapy to, uh, and they're wonderful. I love them. Our, the program where I work uh, within the Buckeye Ranch is very small. Each classroom only has 12 children. They're supervised by a, a teacher and an additional staff person, and then they receive adventure therapy as well as very intensive clinical services as well. So there's even another social worker or counselor who works with that child individually and with their families. So we're really trying a wraparound approach to help them get stable in, in our school so that with the hopes that they can transition back to, back to doing more things out in their community. So if that's team sports, or if that's being able to go back to the school where they got expelled from, um, that's usually our, our ultimate goal, but definitely to keep them out of any higher levels of care is, is always a top priority for us. So that's where I work now. I'm really grateful to have this tiny office because as I said, the kids that I work with have some pretty extreme behaviors. So it's not uncommon to have somebody kicking at my door trying to get in um, or screaming profanity out in the hallway. So um, hopefully you won't hear any of that over my <laughs> headphones today, but in case you do, the kids are still in session. So we've got, we've got a couple more hours to get through, um, but right now all is peaceful. I'm grateful for that. Okay, yeah, there's, there's a question from Karishma, uh, where she's saying like, how does adventure therapy or experiential education work with adolescents, people with substance issues as, or women mm -hmm. who have served time? And so the mm -hmm. question really is like, what do you do exactly? Like, can you maybe describe a session? Just like the, sure. you know, structure of, because what we really like to know is like, what does it look like? Sure, that? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So in terms of substance use, well, boy, that's a really big question and I'm trying to figure out where to start. It's a great question. Um, maybe you can also just choose one population to give us an example, uh, if that helps. Sure, yeah. So um, when working with individuals who have experienced trauma, but in particular individuals who have used substances, um, a really common, really common thread among individuals who've, who've had that life experience is um, difficulty asking for help. Um, so most often individuals who are addicted don't raise their hand and say, I need help. They, they end up in prison, they end up in residential treatment, they end up expelled from school. Um, so they are, are kind of forced into treatment um, necessarily before they're ready to take responsibility for themselves and responsibility for their actions and make change. So where I love how adventure therapy works to engage people um, because we play, that's what we do. So uh, we use nature. So we use a variety of tools. It's not simply talking and having a conversation and asking them to take responsibility and asking them to, to ask their families for help or ask their friends for help or build relationships. We're actually doing it. Um, so one of my favorite um, activities to do with individuals who are struggling with addiction is anything that requires them to ask for help in order to be successful. And that's a lot of my kids here too. So I work with very young kids who most of them have not gotten to a place in their lives where they're using drugs and alcohol to cope with their issues. They might, again, we're trying to, we're trying to catch them early, uh, help them develop their relationships and the self-confidence to be able to, to manage problems in different ways. But um, so for, for, 
the needing help applies to our kids here too, but addicts in particular. Um, so one of the activities that I've seen done very effectively is one that's called Blind Maze. Um, at Camp Mary Orton, we had a, uh, a clearing where we had left several trees and we had created a, uh, a just a line of rope around the trees with some kind of, you know, squigglies in there as well. And um, we would invite the participants into the maze. Um, and uh, the rule was, or the general idea was, when you get into the maze, your challenge is to put on a blindfold and your challenge is to get, your, to get out of the maze. Um, but you won't be able to see. Um, of course, we spot for it and provide some safety expectations and supervise uh, while folks are blindfolded, wandering around trees and ropes. Um, and kind of the, the catch is, um, is that there is no way to get out of the maze. Um, so the, all, the, all the things are dead ends. And what they're challenged to do then is, is admit, like, I can't do this alone, or I need help, or I'm stuck, which is something that's typically very difficult for someone who's dealing to be able to say, to be vulnerable enough to say, I can't deal with this on my own, I need help. Um, and that's the way out of the maze. So if they're willing to ask for help, we invite them to take their blindfold off and then they step out of the maze. And what that also provides them with the opportunity to do is to watch other people struggle. So they get to see, oh, and maybe connect. This person is working so hard to try to manage this virtually impossible activity by themselves. And they look ridiculous or they're, they're sweating or they're upset or they're crying and they're not asking for help. So for some folks, activities like that can be a turning point to recognize the importance of being vulnerable, the, the importance of asking for help, but also to acknowledge how hard it is. And also to be able to talk about like what, what happened in your life that made it so hard for you to ask for help or made it taboo for you to ask for help or made it shameful for you to ask for help. Um, so yeah, so any activities that involve blindfolds um, where someone might need to might need help from someone else to keep them safe or to help guide them to a destination or to retrieve an object um, or to climb over something or go under something um, can be a really excellent activity to use for individuals who are dealing with addiction, but generally anybody that's struggling to ask for help. Does that help? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Really so, helps. oh, it, you, you'd also asked a, day, a question too about like my day here. So again, I work with younger kids between the ages of eight and 12. Um, I am located in a very urban area, uh, right outside the doors of our school is, is four lanes of very heavy traffic. Um, I'm also located in a neighborhood that, that um, has a very high instance of um, individuals who are dealing with addiction. So it's not uncommon for our playground, which is 50 yards away for us to find needles um, for us to find other drug paraphernalia, trash, um, evidence that people have been sleeping there because they're dealing with homelessness. Um, so, so a lot of the work that I do, um, I also work with a lot of um, children of color um, who um, in the United States in particular, um, uh, depending on the color of your skin will impact how the police treat you. So for a lot of the youth that I work with, um, the police presence in the neighborhood is disruptive and disturbing and unsettling and anxiety producing. So a lot of the work that we do is actually inside the building. So while I miss working at Camp Mary Orton, where there is a lot of green space for us to play in, we make it work here. So we've learned to adapt and adjust. So we have a gym, which is great. So huge, big ceilings, um, big enough for two basketball hoops, um, space where we typically do most of our adventure therapy work. Um, so we can set up blindfolded activities in there. Um, we can set up tag games in there. Um, for most of the kids that I work with, learning how to make friends is a huge thing. Learning how to make friends and keep friends, which is also something they struggle with. Um, developing healthy relationships with adults is also something they really struggle with. So um, I have the two classrooms here and I'm assigned to work with them every day, which I also really love. So I get to see them. I get to see their shifts and changes as they, as they grow every day. And I get to be there with them through that process. Um, so, um, so I get each classroom, I get them for one hour each day. We typically go to the gym. We do some sort of feelings check-in, like, how are you doing today? What are you bringing into the room with you? Are you really stressed? Are you really hopeful? What's on your mind? Uh, a lot of that typically has to do with current events for our kiddos. 
Um, so we process that a little bit. And then based on what I've seen from them in terms of what they've been struggling with, I'll pick activities that will help them address some of those issues. And then we'll do those activities in the gym. We'll do some sort of wrap up at the end. Um, given the age of my kiddos and so their level of cognitive functioning. I don't know about you, but when I was 12 years old, I wasn't a real deep thinker. <laughs> so asking the kids that I work with, especially the six, seven and eight year olds to talk about their feelings or to talk about how they think or to talk about their behaviors is really difficult. Um, so we try to get creative. We do, the other thing I love about adventure therapy is that again, that like in the moment opportunity to share some observations, give some feedback, make some suggestions for ways that they could change or shift what they're doing to have a more positive experience or a more positive interaction with somebody else or to try a new skill. So that's a lot of what I do with this age group is a lot of in the moment, pause, tell me what's going on. How about you try this? Um, that's a lot of what I do as opposed to more of the standard, like we've done an activity. Now we're going to sit and talk about the activity. We don't, we don't do that very much. That's a that's more like for older kids, teenagers, totally capable of that level of self-reflection. Um, yeah, older kiddos, adults, yes, for sure. But this age group, it's a lot more point of performance um, feedback. So that's kind of what my day looks like. I also supervise um, a couple of staff down in the residential treatment facility. So I'm back and forth between a couple of facilities. Um, I do a lot of trainings as well. That's a lot of what I do. And where do you learn these activities? Like, do you make some of them up or do you? Totally. Have... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the internet is a great resource. <laughs> um, sometimes what I'll do, um, so I have, a, I have a pretty deep toolbox of activities and that comes from having a lot of experience watching other people um, do adventure therapy and do experiential methods. I love newsletters. So um, there's a couple of practitioners in the United States um, who send out monthly newsletters with great ideas um, that I can take and adapt for this population. Um, I love my team. So we oftentimes take time in our team meetings to talk about what are you doing with your kids? What's a new activity that you've tried? Tell me about it. Let's play it together and see how we might be able to use it. Um, Kent Mary Orton had a really uh, thick manual of activities. So you could flip through the pages um, and read about different activities. And we've gotten them from it's, it's very open source, the field of adventure therapy. There are no secrets. There are no like, no, this is my activity. No, no. It's like you take it and you run with it and you do it however you want. You know, that's authentic, feels authentic for you and feels like it's going to be the best fit for the population that you work with. I do love that about the field as well. Um, so, um, so yeah, so that's how I've learned is by watching other people, by reading a lot, by crowdsourcing, um, chat groups um, on the internet, also talking about activities they've done with folks and how they've processed them um, and adapted them. Super helpful. Workshops, conferences are all great places to go play and learn. Cool. Thanks. That's helpful. Um, and yeah, and that brings us to, you know, just, I know that you've done a master's in social work, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. just curious about like training. And then that will bring us to Santosh's question, which is, that, you know, if you are an experiential educator um, and you have an adventure in nature background, you know, maybe done some outdoor courses, um, how would you get into the therapy space? Uh, but before that, just to know a little bit about your training and then just any advice on what would be, you know, guidance on how would someone transition to therapy if they have all those other pieces? Yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh, you would be welcome in the field of adventure therapy if you've got I love working with folks who've been like a camp counselor or um, have worked with kids because chances are folks already come with tools in their toolbox that they can use to um, apply to, to work in therapy. So I would say you're, you're well set up if you've already got some experience um, yeah, running activities and being out and even being out in nature yourself. That was also part of my steep learning curve was I didn't grow up in a family that, that camped or backpacked or spent a lot of time out in nature really was not something that we were kind of pushed or encouraged to do. I'd never been climbing before. I'd never slept in a tent uh, before my internship. So there were a lot of things that I had to learn experientially too. Um, and Tanya, when you asked about training, do you mean like trainings that I facilitate or do you mean like trainings that I've done that have helped me become an adventure therapist? Trainings that you've done to become an adventure therapist. Got it. Okay. Um, 
a lot of that came from my um, first job at Camp Mary Orton. They have um, a very structured um, training process. Um, we learn about how to, how to facilitate games and initiatives, and there's a checkout process. So where somebody comes and observes you, gives you feedback, and either says, yes, continue on, you did a nice job, or like, nope, here, we need to come back to the learning table and, and discuss these particular things, and I want to see you try again. So camp has a very nice mentoring program and training program. Um, so I'm so grateful for that. They definitely helped me understand, um, you know, structure and application and practice it and get feedback about that. Um, so Camp Mary Orton was very helpful in that sense. Um, I also have to thank my supervisor. So I've had the blessing of being able to work with Kim Sackstetter um, here in Columbus for, for the last 11 years. Um, and she was a part of the group that did the therapeutic adventure best practices um, document. That's um, so like how to do therapeutic adventure, how to do adventure therapy. Um, she was one of the original authors. She's also an author of um, a recent book, Adventure Group Psychotherapy. Um, so she is a wealth of information and as humble as she is, she is an excellent teacher. Um, so I've been under her wing for the last 11 years and plan to for the rest of my life, just for the record. So even if she moves on and takes another job, I'm still, she did say, she was like, you have a lifetime of phone calls. I'm like, great. So I do think also having a mentor and having somebody to, to give you feedback um, who understands the field is really important as well. Yeah, I just want to say Kim is offering some courses on adventure-therapist.com right now. I'm enrolled in one of them. They're like these mini courses, so you can look them up. Um, I've also had the privilege of knowing her and through her is I think how I could visit Camp Mary Orton. She's absolutely wonderful. So you can mm -hmm. look up uh, adventure therapist. Um, dot com to also directly learn from her um so yeah um also just curious about like people places like things i know you've already named a few but just what supports you in doing this work like sustainably you know in a way that you've been able to do it for the last 11 years mm -hmm. um, so yeah what are some yeah. of those things that support you one well, and i'll be honest um so I used to do direct service. So working with kids 40 hours a week, five days a week, I used to, I got tired <laughs> after about eight or nine years of working with kids with very intensive needs and doing that very often. I definitely waved a white flag and was like, I need a break. Like I, I need to, I need to do a little less of this. Like I felt like I was showing up with, without that level of like enthusiasm and energy that I really wanted to, that I really wanted to show up with. So I'm now only doing um, direct service part-time, which has really helped me to, to be able to show up with the energy and the enthusiasm and the level of planning and execution and intentionality that um, I think is really important for the kids. They deserve that. Um, so, um, but yeah, boy, when I was doing work <laughs> full-time, full-time direct service, um, part of that for me has always been a team being a part of a team. So for those of you who practice individually as private practitioners, um, or you're maybe the only adventure therapist or the only person who's using experiential methods, that can be really draining. Um, so I have been so grateful to be surrounded by teams of people who either, even if they're not adventure therapists, they understand what I'm trying to accomplish and they understand how I fit in. So they welcome, you know, they welcome and they support and we, we do that with each other. Um, that's really critical, um, I think. Um, and if you don't have that, finding people out in the community. So like this phone call is an amazing thing, I think. Um, bringing together people with common interests where you can talk and you can ask questions and hear about other people's experiences, um, I think is very, very important. So I, I attend the um, Association for Experiential Education International Conference every year. And I find my therapeutic adventure professional group. And those are the people that I, get my energy from and I get rejuvenated from. Um, so my team is here on the daily basis um, and then having this international community to tap into for support and encouragement and ideas and, um, and uh, inspiration is also really important. Yeah, what are some ways in which you kind of care for yourself when work gets overwhelming? 
Um, I don't have it with me today, but I've started carrying my ukulele with me. <laughs> that helps me. I think I don't know much about music in the brain, but I do think it activates different parts of the brain. So after a particularly stressful group, I'll come in here and play a musical instrument for a few minutes. And I feel like I've pushed a reset button. That really helps me a lot. Um, not keeping my fluorescent lights on and having desk lamps helps me on the day, on a day to day. This building also doesn't have any windows, believe it or not. So challenging myself to try to go outside and get fresh air, digging in my garden. So when I get home, going and getting my hands dirty, making sure I'm exercising regularly. I recognize when I don't, the pandemic made that very difficult. For those of you who are in very urban settings, I have so much sympathy for you because I, I have the benefit of having a backyard and having a neighborhood with very wide streets and not a whole lot of traffic so I can get out and not have to worry about getting other people sick or getting illness from other people. So I hear about friends that live in apartment buildings in New York City who literally can't leave their apartment buildings. And I just, I don't know, that would, that would be destruction for my mental health, I think. So, um, so there's definitely some privileges that I have that have helped me uh, maintain uh, my mental health over the years. So access to nature is definitely a big one for me as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a question in the chat uh, from Santosh. It's a bit of a jump to another topic, but um, it says, he's saying, are there any tangible impact measurements practiced in adventure therapy? If yes, just can you give us a quick example of a way that you, which you measure impact? Mm -hmm impact measurements? This is a great question. And I think what you're hitting on might be, I'm going to try to answer the question. So please feel free to ask a follow-up. I feel like you kind of missed my point. <laughs> um, this is an, I think what you're highlighting might be one of the things that we're trying to figure out in adventure therapy. So um, what we're learning about therapy in general is that a majority of the positive impact that we're able to have on our clients is is almost entirely based on our relationship, not the type of practice that we engage in. So if, if my philosophy was, if I utilized cognitive behavioral therapy or adventure therapy or um, psychodynamic theory, or I worked in an office or I worked, um, I don't know, at a school, it wouldn't matter. The part that matters is my relationship with the client. So truly my ability to be human and to be authentic and to show up and connect with somebody is most of what creates the positive change for our clients. So what we're learning about in adventure therapy is that given that the practice of adventure therapy is showing up, recognizing how you show up and how your clients are showing up, and then providing them with an experience that helps them explore whatever it is that they're showing up with that day and trying to help make and manage change, there, you can't systematize that. So for example, I don't have a curriculum. Maybe I should. I don't have a curriculum. I walk, I have an idea and I walk into the door, I check in with the kids and I might completely throw that idea out the window um, and shift and do something different based on how they're showing up and what need they're presenting in that moment. Um, so I can imagine what I hear from researchers is that's very difficult to study. When you have a curriculum, you can repeat it. So you can have some level of fidelity um, in terms of the research that you do. But like what I do with the kids, I don't know how somebody would research that. We could use an outcome measure. So we could, um, we could do a, a depression scale. Um, we could rate their level of anxiety and see how that changes over time. Um, we can use teacher feedback. We could use parent feedback. We could do client feedback. Um, but none of those are necessarily adventure therapy specific. So I don't know if that answers your question, but we use one outcome measure here at the Buckeye Ranch and we use it regardless of what service the client receives. And there are some kids like community-based, there are no adventure therapy practitioners that work with kids out in the community. I work in day treatment. We have individuals down in residential who do adventure therapy, but then there's other kids at a different level of care who don't receive adventure therapy services, but they get the same outcome measures. Um, so unless we looked at our outcome measures of clients who are receiving adventure therapy compared to kids who are not receiving adventure therapy, we don't really know if adventure therapy itself is the, is the impacting the change. I don't know, I'm gonna stop there because I don't know if I'm, I'm answering your question. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, feel free, Santosh, to also like ask for. Okay, cool. He did the thumbs up. But yeah, all y'all can feel free to like jump in, ask a follow up question. That's totally fine. um as well i'm just going to kind of like move to the next because i think we have like about 10 minutes so i i, I just want i know there are a few more questions uh lined up um so tejesh is wondering how an activity normally people focus on completing it or how an activity can be used as therapy for especially for children and adults for changing their beliefs and perceptions so if you have maybe an example um mm-hmm. something about changing beliefs i know that yeah. this helium hoop one is the one i saw at camp mary orton that <laughs> i hate called? helium hoop that's yeah, so funny yeah that's the one that i saw which i think was about changing perceptions but yeah tell me why you hate oh. helium hoop oh i hate helium hoop okay <laughs> helium hoop for those of you who don't know the group has to hold out two fingers like this and stand in a circle and you rest the hoop on top of their fingers they start on the ground and their challenge is to try to come to standing without anyone losing contact of their finger on the on the hoop so it's a lot about accountability and responsibility and being like oops i messed up which is also really hard for people to do it's a good thing to practice um but then also it's a lot about communication and problem solving so i hate helium hoop because the kids that i work with have such a low frustration tolerance <laughs> that if i gave them helium hoop they would explode it would just be exploded children everywhere Um so we typically go for less challenging initiatives. I might pull out helium hoop like at the end of a school year when we've done a lot of work, but oftentimes we're still simply working on trying to manage our emotions and express ourselves that helium hoop is like too much, too much for them. Um so that's why I'm laughing. Um let's see. So uh, I'm trying to think of an example. Yeah, I can actually so I did a climbing activity in the gym uh very recently uh called inchworm. um where there's uh see if you can I'll like draw it with my fingers for those of you guys who are more visual um there's two very thick ropes that are run through eye bolts hanging out of the ceiling um that come up and over uh on one end is what looks like a triangle that has a wooden platform here um so there's two of those um and then the ropes are up and through and kind of laying on the floor so the way this activity works is um one person can be the inchworm and what they do is they come up to those triangles and they slide their feet in so they become like little little pedals for their feet and then they can hold on to the ropes um and the rest of the group holds the loose end of the rope and pulls and lifts them up into the ceiling and the reason why it's called inchworm is because the person who's climbing also has to do some work typically the group is not strong enough to quite literally lift or pull the person these are just your standard spliced ropes these aren't anything fancy these aren't climbing ropes the the person is on belay so i'm their safety um so i've got them on belay in case the group is struggling or they're struggling to communicate with each other kind of breaks down i can keep them from coming all the way back down to the ground um so what needs to happen is the inchworm needs to bend their knee and that is one of the most difficult things to try to explain and then have them execute. I don't know about you, but when I'm dangling from the air, my heart rate is pretty high. <laughs> so, what we know about the brain is that when we're triggered or when our heart rate is elevated, we're going to have a hard time using the front part of our brain. We're going to be in our back brain. We're going to be way more concerned about our safety than we are about following directions. So, even with both feet on the ground and doing this explaining this to them like you have to lift your leg so that the group can pull the rope tight and then you get to use it like a step and you straighten that leg and then you lift this leg and that group pulls that rope so you eventually end up inchworming your way up into the ceiling if you can get all those pieces working together so hopefully that explanation of the activity makes sense so what was happening with my group and very classic for my group the person who was the inchworm was getting curious with the groups that were pulling on the ropes because their perception was you're not working hard enough when in reality they were standing with their legs completely straight and all of their weight into those foot pedals so the group couldn't lift them up so we did it twice and so we had that opportunity to struggle with it the first time and then come back to it and reflect on that experience of like Yeah, you did a terrible job and you did a terrible job. Let's talk about what else was happening. So 
that's kind of an example of where we can explore perceptions. And I, I, wrote, I wrote on the board for us to talk about um, that it's really hard to help someone. And it's really, really hard to help someone who won't help themselves. So we, we use that, that quote or that, that idea to talk about inchworm and how this person wasn't helping themselves by bending their knee. So then the rest of the group couldn't help them and how that happens in the classroom sometimes. So we talked about like who has a really hard time helping yourself and who's close to graduating. So what kinds of, you know, you're, you're close to graduating this program because you figured out a way to help yourself. Like nobody here in this room is waving a magic wand at you. That's not why you're graduating. You're graduating because you did work because you figured out how to stay calm when things around you are chaotic, because you figured out how to look at a math worksheet and take a deep breath before you rip it up and run out the door and ask for help, you know, or whatever, ask for headphones when it's noisy. You figured out those things. That's how you've helped yourself. And that's allowed us to help you. So is that helpful in terms of like an example of how we can use an activity to challenge some beliefs? Okay. I have a question. Uh, it has nothing to do with this exercise, um, but I was, I actually wanted to know, and you don't have to answer, but how do you make this financially sustainable? Who pays for these courses and how do you do that? Because I yeah. feel like to make it relevant in India, that's something we all have to figure out as well. Yes, you are 100% correct. So um, I have the benefit of working for a larger organization um, that does the billing for me. So they bill insurance. So I'm in some ways I'm removed from that. What allows me to be able to, to bill insurance is that I have a license. So that helps I'm a licensed social worker. Um, but I, we also, in terms of the insurance part, uh, what makes, what makes adventure therapy therapy is that intentionality piece. So it doesn't matter if we're playing with pool noodles or if we're playing with poly spots or if we're sitting and having a conversation, this is billable, right? Like we know insurance will pay for sitting and having a conversation. So if I can justify how pool noodles and poly spots also helps us get to that same destination of insight and practicing new skills, um, all of the things that therapy is supposed to help our kids do, they will pay for it. Um, I have to be really careful to not say I played with the kids in my notes because <laughs> they won't pay for that. Shocker. Um, they won't play. They won't pay for us. For, so if my, if my, as a practitioner, if my documentation of the service that I'm providing says, you know, I played with the kids or we did sharks and minnows or we went outside and we walked around, they won't pay for that. But if I can justify how those activities help them reach their goals, they will. Um, so that's one benefit of working for a larger organization is they, they understand what I do, they support it. Um, so they help me with that billing process. And also I've gotten really good at writing clinical documentation <laughs> and explaining why I do what I do. Thank you. Um, is also just wondering, like for someone who's just starting out, uh, in this mm -hmm. space, um, do you have any advice? Oh man. Um, trying to think about like maybe what I wish somebody would have told me. Um, I would say for any therapist who's starting out in the field, um, if you're familiar with that term of parallel process, um, the idea is that you're challenging other people to grow. Those are your clients. You're challenging them to grow, but at the same time, you're going to grow too. Um, and it's really, really hard. So it doesn't matter if you're doing adventure therapy, if you're doing cognitive behavioral therapy, if you're using some other approach, it doesn't matter. Um, so taking the time to do your own self-reflection, having your own support. So somebody you can talk to about your experience and being able to separate that because that's not your client's job. <laughs> it's not your client's job to help you process what's happening for you. That's for you to bracket and set aside and take to supervision or take to your mentor and say, this was happening for me while this was happening in group. Can you help me process that and understand that? And then you have to be responsible for change. Um, so it's, it can be really exhausting. It can be really draining. Um, and it's also very important for your growth as a practitioner to go through that process. Um, something else I think that's really important for people to know is that 
and this could be more reflective. I'm a lifelong learner. That's just what I do. That's one of my strengths is I, I'm a learner. I'm always interested in, in learning new things and growing as hard as it is. Um, so I'm always seeking out learning opportunities um, that, that it is your responsibility to do that on a consistent basis um, as long as you're doing the work. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. And a couple of like quick fun questions. Um, sure. Is like, what's a unique gift that you have? Oh dear, I didn't think about that one. I think you even prepped me with that question. I should have had an answer. Uh, a unique gift that I have. I don't know. If, I don't know if it's unique. Um, I'm pretty good in the kitchen. That's fun. I'm pretty loose wristed with my seasonings, and for somehow somehow it just works out pretty well. I love making a mess in the kitchen and I'm really okay with that. I'm somehow at peace. So I feel like that's a unique gift. <laughs> making a mess in the kitchen and being able to conjure up some halfway decent food. <laughs> and what's your favorite way to engage with nature? Like just by yourself. Oh, when Yeah, by myself is being in my garden, in I think. Garden. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I have a lot of square footage, probably too much square footage, um, but I love that process. I love cycles. So I love, I compost and then I put my compost on my garden and then I grow food out of my garden and then I eat the food and then I compost it and then it goes on my garden and then I grow food and then I eat the food. It's my favorite. I love that. I love being a part of that cycle and a part of that process. To me, it's just magical. And if you were an animal, what animal would you be? Totally a bird. I would love to Any fly. bird, like a specific bird or just any oh. bird? No, I'm pretty easy. I'm, I'm not picky. I would take any yeah. bird, any Same. bird really. Maybe one that lives near the ocean. That would be kind of cool to be able to like fly over water and then be over land. That would be nice. I wouldn't mind being a migrating bird. That also blows my mind that they yeah. travel thousands of miles every year yeah. to live in different climates. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And maybe if you could share like some book and resources i think karishma was also wondering like are they just just websites um mm -hmm. yeah yeah mm -hmm. if you're not already on um facebook and a part of the aee community and the uh, therapeutic adventure professional group community please come join us there's always lively conversation there are really active um really active participants who are researchers and uh, devour research so that's also wonderful um, is it's not simply conversation about like, it's it's what's happening in the field, it's developments in the field. So um, I love being a part of those conversations. Um, and they're great. They're also a great group to um, crowdsource. So pitch out a question, pitch out an idea, introduce yourself and, and folks will, will jump in. Um, so TAPG is a very lively community, a very lively, robust online community. Um, uh, Tanya already mentioned the adventure-therapists.com um, group. Um, that's Kim Sackstetter, my, my boss and mentor, um, as well as Nick Magley uh, Habrek, both two brilliant practitioners, seasoned practitioners who are putting together trainings and cohorts of people to go through trainings together. Um, fantastic resource. Um, let's see, AEE is going to be virtual this year again. So um, considering um, signing up for the virtual conference, um, could be a good place to go as well to network, meet people, go to workshops, learn about new activities. Um, um, and TAPG does a, uh, will do workshops again, specific to adventure therapy and therapeutic adventure. Um, I have a couple of books, standby. Um, so these two books live on my shelf at work and I make sure that everybody has access to them. So this is like the textbook of adventure therapy. So this is a great investment. Um, and this book was recently released, um, which is also um, an excellent resource. Um, there's lots of activities that are free online. Uh, Jim Kane has an entire PDF that you can download of uh, raccoon circle activities, and he's not the only one. So, um, so uh, researching some activities online. Uh, newsletters, I see that in the chat as well. Um, 
Michelle Cummings, C-U-M-M-I-N-G-S. Um, she runs a company called Training Wheels. Um, she puts out a newsletter once every week or two. Sometimes it's mostly um, commercial, you know, like she's trying to sell some of her products. Um, but oftentimes she weaves little nuggets of practice in there um, that I will I will take um, and uh, modify for my my population. Um, and it's free, so you can't argue with free. Um, I don't mind reading a few of her like buy my stuff in order to get some good information. Uh, Jen Stanchfield, uh, Jennifer Stanchfield is another uh, person who releases uh, newsletters uh, of a similar flavor. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's also a couple of podcasts. Uh, Mari Lung and Bobby Beal have a podcast. I cannot remember what it's called. Tanya, have you heard of it? Yeah, I've heard a few episodes. I'll uh, pull up the name. But yeah, yeah. Any other uh, podcasts apart from hers, theirs? Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of other You know, other maybe when I upload this, I will put these links in the description as well. Um, yeah. Any other podcasts apart from Bobby and Maurice? Uh, there... I think it's called Adventures in the Field. I think that's what that one's it's called. It's called, um, so Pondering Life Adventures is Bob. There is it Bobby is. and Maurice, no? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And I think they, the way they describe it is a little more personal in nature, but could still be a good listen. Um, yeah, and they're both like brilliant, two brilliant practitioners. When you listen to the podcast. <laughs> which, nice. which sounds awesome. Yeah. 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 They're my uh, Will, like Shiro. Will, Yes, yes. Um, Will White is another person who, who uh, he does the yeah, other podcast yeah. whose name I cannot remember. The Stories from the Field one, I think. Yeah, I think that's what that one's called. I think so. I'll have to verify that. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Any, any other like last questions? I think we're about to wrap up in a couple of minutes. Um, I don't have a question, but I really like the metaphorical exercises that you described and how mm -hmm. and how you use your activities to have lessons almost mm -hmm. uh, where, they, where they're so symbolic. Um, yeah, and I, I don't think anyone's talked about these symbolic exercises in the sessions that we've had so far. One of my favorite things about adventure, well, I've said that like six times, my favorite thing about adventure therapy, <laughs> just add it to the list. <laughs> um, and I, I love consulting too. Um, so if you have a problem or you have, you know, you there's a particular something or other you want to address with a group or with a particular client and you, you want some ideas for activities or questions to ask, I love, 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 love talking about that. So um, Tanya has my email. You're welcome to shoot me an email um, anytime. Pitch out a pitch out a story, pitch out a puzzle, and I love helping people puzzle through those things. Thank you. That's really really sweet of you. I think I will like whoever wants can also reach out, and I'm happy to share the email. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's been so wonderful because anyone we've invited up here is like, yeah, here's my email. Just reach out if you need anything. So just feeling um, so grateful. Uh, that you could make the time to be here today, Beth. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I think I, there's so much I've uh, taken away and um, I'm so excited to just like also read this, the group uh, therapy book that's recently out. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for being here today.